This week in wrestling history, we go back 48 years ago this week on July 20th, 1973. The legendary Jack Briscoe won his first of two NWA titles from Harley Race in Houston, Texas. A reign that would last exactly 500 days. He dropped the title to Giant Baba in Japan, but then won it back a week later and held it for another year before dropping it to Terry Funk. He spent a total of 866 days as NWA champion. 37 years ago this week, MTV aired The Brawl to End It All on July 23rd, 1984 from Madison Square Garden, doing a massive 9.0 cable rating, the most watched broadcast by far of anything in the history of MTV up to that point in the history of MTV. Hulk Hogan retained his WWF championship over Greg Valentine. Antonio Inoki beat Charlie Fulton to retain his WWF World Martial Arts title, created by Vince McMahon Sr. and awarded to Inoki in 1978 upon his arrival in America. Inoki also won a 20-man battle royal. In all, there were 11 matches on the card. Only one aired on TV. And that was Wendy Richter's title win over the fabulous Moolah, capturing the WWF Women's Championship, ending Moolah's ridiculous run as champion of 27 years. Or 10,170 days as champion. It's insane. 29 years ago this week, on July 20th, 1992, at the Superstars taping in Worcester, Massachusetts, Earthquake and Typhoon, the natural disasters, after chasing Money, Inc. all year, including a match at WrestleMania that they won by countout, finally won the WWE Tag Team titles. This was the second straight time those titles had changed hands at a house show that year. Money, Inc. had beaten LOD for the belts in February in a match that was never televised. There would be three more tag team title changes at house shows in 1993, and four of them in 1994. That's nine WWF tag team title changes in the span of two and a half years, all at house shows. 28 years ago this week, on July 25th, 1993, hell froze over for the second time in two years when Jim Cornette made his WWE debut at a Monday Night Raw taping in Alexandria Bay, New York, I live in New York, and I have no fucking clue where Alexandria Bay even is. The first time, though, that hell froze over was when Jerry Lawler debuted on Primetime Wrestling the year before. After all the years of negative comments that he made about the company and about Vince McMahon, and actually saying hell would freeze over before he ever worked for Vince. He even sued them. He sued WWE years earlier when they started calling Harley Race the king of wrestling, and he won the suit. And they couldn't use the King gimmick when they would run shows in the state of Tennessee. But how Cornette ended up in the company was really just almost happenstance. And he ended up spending 12 years of his life working there. So at the time, Cornette had already been out of WCW for a few years. And he had started his own promotion, Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And he was very friendly with Bruce Pritchard. They would talk every now and then on the phone. He managed Bruce's brother, Tom, right? Dr. Tom was part of the Heavenly Bodies in Smoky Mountain. And they wanted to play just a, a friendly joke on Bruce one day. So at their TV taping, he and the Bodies did a promo with Pritchard's dad. They brought their dad in, doing a promo about how their family had become something of a dynasty in wrestling. And Cornette asked if they had any other family members involved in the wrestling business. And Papa Pritchard said that they had one other family member working for that fake wrestling company in New York. And here I thought Cornette hated the F word. And he had somebody using it on his own show. Anyway, the promo, it was not meant to air on TV. I don't believe it ever, ever actually aired on television. But he called Bruce and he told him, hey, your dad just cut this great promo. Right, he, he didn't tell him any of the actual verbiage that was used. He just said, oh man, your father cut a hell of a promo. I'm going to put it on VHS and I'm going to send it to you. And Bruce was all excited and says, I can't wait to see it. About a week later, Cornette gets a call from Bruce 
saying, Very funny, motherfucker. And he mentioned that he had not been alone when he watched that tape. So you can figure out who he was talking about. But then, to uh, Cornette's surprise, he turned around and he asked him if he wanted, if, if he and the boys, you know, the, the bodies, wanted to make some shots for the WWF. And Cornette was stunned when he realized that he was serious, and he was even more stunned when Bruce told him that Vince McMahon was even willing to mention Smoky Mountain on WWF television. So he and the Heavenly Bodies, they flew to New York. Once he got there, he was ushered into a meeting with Vince and Pat Patterson, and he figured, okay, this is going to be sort of the the coming-to-Jesus type meeting here with Vince McMahon. He's going to confront me about all the terrible things that I've said about him and his company over the years. But he quickly realized that Vince didn't even know about any of the comments that he had made. He didn't watch any wrestling other than his own. So he didn't see any of those promos. He didn't read any magazine interviews that Cornette may have done. He didn't know about any of it, and Cornette wasn't going to tell him. But he, he realized that the real reason they wanted him was to pitch him on the idea of becoming Yokozuna's American spokesperson. Mr. Fuji was his manager, but Mr. Fuji wasn't exactly a promo god. And they needed somebody who could cut promos for Yoko. So he could do that, and he could manage the Heavenly Bodies as well. And they knew, they were smart enough to know, if they didn't sell him on being able to bring in the bodies and being able to promote Smoky Mountain, he never would have agreed to come in. He would have, he would have turned him down and said no. They had discussions back in, I think it was 86, about the possibility of Cornette coming in. Uh, possibly with the Midnight Express, and... You know, obviously he decided against it. So it's not as if he would have, you know, it would have been hard for him to say no. Oh, you know, it's WWF, it's New York, I have to go. He would have easily said no. So they sweetened the pot and made him an offer that he couldn't refuse. And that's how he ended up working for WWE. Now, Bobby the Brain Heenan, as far as how they did his debut on TV, Bobby Heenan was doing commentary on Raw next to Vince McMahon. He could hardly contain his excitement when he saw Cornette walk out to the ring. He was like a, he was like a little kid when he saw Cornette come out. He sold this so great. He put him over, literally called him the greatest manager of all time, which is high praise coming from the brain. Cornette did the same with him. It was like a mutual admiration society amongst heel managers. Two of the best managers in the history of the business sharing a ring together was a sight to see. Now, Bobby is the best manager of all time. Cornette is either number two or number three behind Paul Heyman. I've, I've kind of waffled on who I would put in number two, but they would make up the top three for sure of greatest managers in the history of the business. 27 years ago this week on July 22nd, 1994, Vince McMahon was acquitted in a Long Island courtroom on a single count of conspiracy to distribute steroids. This is from the New York Times story following the verdict. Vincent K. McMahon, who brought professional wrestling into the entertainment mainstream, was acquitted today by a jury in federal district court of charges that he conspired to distribute steroids to his wrestlers. The verdict produced hugs and tears among the 48-year-old Mr. McMahon, his wife Linda, and his lawyers, and cheers from wrestling fans who have faithfully attended the 18-day trial. In a news conference outside the courthouse, Mr. McMahon said, The World Wrestling Federation is about fun. It's not about courtrooms. Prosecutors called 11 wrestlers to support their case against Mr. McMahon, who did not testify. But only one, Kevin Nails Wachholz, testified that Mr. McMahon directed him to use steroids. The defense called no witnesses. The most closely watched witness in the trial was Hulk Hogan. The wrestler admitted that he had taken steroids for 13 years and that he had routinely picked them up with his fan mail and his paycheck at WWF headquarters, but he said Mr. McMahon never encouraged him to take the drugs. And McMahon later teased that he would sue the federal government, but uh, ultimately he did not. Who does that remind you of? The two counts of distribution were dismissed earlier in the week due to lack of evidence. That's why it was only the one count. 
that was left. There was so much craziness packed into this trial. Again, it didn't even last a full three weeks. And there was just so much craziness. But I think my favorite part is Afa of the Wild Samoans being reprimanded by the judge for mouthing the words not guilty to the jury as a way to intimidate them. It's like, no wonder the Samoans have always had such a cushy spot in that company. When the verdict was read, the prosecutor's jaw dropped and all of the WWF fans in the courtroom just erupted into cheer like they were at a live event. The judge stood up, very angry. He ordered anybody who cheered just now to leave the room, which no nobody did. If this happened today, they all would have chanted what at the judge? 21 years ago this week, on July 23rd, 2000, WWE featured three newer names in three featured matches, the big three matches on the show, and every single one of them lost. Kurt Angle lost to The Undertaker. Not a very good match. They would go on to have much better ones. Chris Jericho and Triple H, that was the complete opposite. They had a fantastic last man standing match that even though Triple H won, he barely won. It did not hurt Jericho at all. And it is the best match that those two ever had together. And in the main event, The Rock retained his WWE title over Chris Benoit in an excellent match. This was also the show where Rikishi wrestled Val Venus in a steel cage match for the Intercontinental title. And this is one of those highlight reel moments that does not get replayed by WWE very often. And I can't understand why. You know, as much as you see Hogan lifting Andre at the beginning of the signature every week and Shawn Michaels coming down on the zip line at WrestleMania, like, I get that's WrestleMania. So, you know, th those moments are going to stand out more. This moment does not get the attention that it deserves. Here you have Rikishi. Whatever they were billing him as, they were probably calling him 400 pounds. He probably wasn't too far off from that, okay? Every, every bit of 350, okay? He's a big guy. And he climbs to the top of the cage. And it looks like he's going to do like a, a, a splash from like the corner of the cage. Like he's teasing that he might jump off. He might have his, his Jimmy Snooker moment here. But then he goes and he inches his way over to the middle of the beam. Instead of doing it in the corner and kind of holding on to something, he is holding on to nothing. And you could see, I mean, he looks like his heart's about to beat out of his chest. The heart, My heart's about to beat out of my chest when I watch it. He's not holding on to anything. And he's just inching over and inching over. I mean, <laughs> it, it, so many things could have gone wrong there. So that was kind of, made me nervous enough watching it. And then there he is, standing right in the middle of the beam. Looking directly ahead, right into the hard cam. They zoom in on his face, the building, everybody's going crazy. And you have this big-ass dude doing a giant splash from the top of this cage. It had to be every bit of 12 feet up, right? 10 or 12 feet up in the air. Down onto Val Venus. Credit to Val, because I would have been scared shitless taking a bump like that. I'm sure he knocked the wind out of that guy. Just visually, it was such an impressive spot. But what made this so stupid was... You do this amazing spot, it gets this great reaction, and he doesn't win the match with it. He didn't win the title. He went to go escape, Taz showed up, I don't even remember why, slammed the door on his head, and Val Venus won the match and retained the title. So for all that, he didn't even fucking win. Ridiculous. 20 years ago this week, the less said about this, the better. On July 22nd, 2001, WWE presented the Invasion pay-per-view with the Alliance, defeating Team WWF in the main event with an assist from that uh, Benedict Arnold himself, Stone Cold Steve Austin, who had briefly turned babyface on Raw six days earlier when he agreed to join the WWF crew to challenge the invaders, but then he went right back to being a heel. He cost them the victory because, as Jim Ross recently said, Steve just really wanted to be a heel. The show pulled in 775,000 pay-per-view buys, more than any other non-WrestleMania pay-per-view in the history of the company, still to this day. 
Now imagine if they hadn't bungled the invasion and they built to a proper supercard. How many buys that would have gotten? If this show did 775, holy shit. Can you imagine what a real supercard could have done? Maybe the following year, WrestleMania the following year. By the time the invasion angle ended, four months later, they had cut their pay-per-view audience in half. Earl Hebner beat Nick Patrick in a battle of the referees. Rob Van Dam beat Jeff Hardy to win the hardcore title. Trish Stratus and Lita beat Tori Wilson and Stacey Keebler in a bra and panties match. And in the main event, Booker T, Diamond Dallas Page, Rhino, and the Dudley Boys beat Steve Austin, Kurt Angle, Chris Jericho, Kane, and The Undertaker in what they build as the inaugural brawl. 19 years ago this week, on July 21st, 2002, WWE presented its Vengeance pay-per-view from the Joe in Detroit, featuring one of the greatest triple threat matches in company history for the undisputed championship with The Undertaker defending against Kurt Angle and The Rock, a match that Triple H likely would have been part of were it not for an elbow injury he was recovering from, so Kurt Angle got the spot instead. Rock winning the title made him the first seven-time champion in WWE history, but he was only a transitional champion. He dropped the belt to Brock Lesnar at SummerSlam one month later. Also on this show, Triple H made his choice. He was being courted by both Raw and SmackDown, both GMs. Led at the time SmackDown was by his storyline ex-wife, Stephanie McMahon, who was trying to convince him to stay with the blue brand. Eric Bischoff wanted him on Raw. Triple H called Bischoff an arrogant prick. He called Stephanie a cold-hearted bitch. Shawn Michaels came out. He admitted that he and Kevin Nash wanted him in the NWO, but since the NWO is no more, he wanted him on Raw anyway so that they can make Bischoff's life a living hell. And he chose Raw for a DX reunion with Shawn Michaels that turned out to be very short-lived because the very next night on Raw... Triple H turned heel on Shawn Michaels to set up Shawn's comeback match at SummerSlam. Originally, the co-main at SummerSlam was going to be Triple H against Kevin Nash. I would say we got the better end of that. And also on this Raw show, Eddie Guerrero challenged The Rock to a match where if he won, he would get a championship match the following week on TV. Eddie was furious that his little girls had posters of The Rock, or, or I think it was The Scorpion King, on their walls and not posters of himself. And so he pulled down all The Rock posters and he burned them. And his little girls cried, Poor K, Poor K. Rock wanted to know if he was Cheech or if he was Chong. The thing I remember about the match was the awesome counter that Eddie had to The Rock Bottom. I had never seen that before. And I haven't seen it since. It is still the best counter I've ever seen to a Uranage in any match. But he didn't win. So he never did get his title match. 